Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray.
that tells his flock that that flock should accept the first Messiah that sets foot on this earth. That's to say the spurious Messiah because he comes at the sixth trump. Most people can count. The gathering back to Christ does not take place until the seventh trump. And God has work for the Christian to do, and it's written in the 13th chapter of Mark, the 24th chapter of Matthew, 21st chapter of Luke, the things that you're supposed to do, that you will be delivered up before the synagogue of Satan, that the Holy Spirit will speak to you, as I was quoting a moment ago from the book of Joel, both sons and daughters. Now, well, what's these stout words? Well, when some preacher would say to you, Dear one, you don't have to understand the book of Revelations. It's sealed. Just follow me. You don't have to understand any of that because you're going to be gone. Well, you see, he can't figure. And those are strong words against the living God because he expects you to worship the one that died on the cross for you. And the preacher is wanting you to worship the devourer. Because that's who the first Messiah is that appears soon. I don't know. Haven't you been taught that? Those are stout words against God because he has given you warning after warning after warning in his word. Be not deceived. He did not say in Mark 13, maybe the false Christ would come first. He said he will come first. And yet you have Christians that sing the little song, oh, I'm gone, I'm out of here. When the word revelation, regardless of what language, Greek, English, you wish to translate it from, it means to uncover and to reveal. How can you call it sealed after Christ died on the cross to break the lock? It's talking about apostasy in that verse, my dear one. Verse 14. Ye have said it is vain to serve God, and what profit is it that we have kept his ordinances, and that we have walked uh, mournfully before the Lord of hosts? That's to say, walked in black, walked in black, like in weeping. Have they kept his ordinances? This is a very unusual word in the Hebrew. I'll, I'll speak more of it in a moment. And, uh, well, I, I suppose I should now. We, we um, were told back in verse 7 where it says, Ye are gone away from mine ordinances. All right? Well, the word there is, it, it is um, from the prime, uh, it is kokak uh, from kwak. And, and it means literally to do the will of God. But the ordinances here, it's a real special word in this 14th verse, and you should learn uh, the difference. It's, it is not uh, kwakak. Here, it is mishmeref. Mishmeref. It's a special word. It means to be a watchman, or, or to be a sentry. You know what a sentry is? That's somebody that's on guard to protect, to keep the commandments. So what? So that no one can change it. This is a very unusual word. And I don't know. I wonder how many people in this nation today, if we were to break up the ordinances, commandments, and the law, if they would know the difference. I doubt it. We could throw statutes in on top of that and we'd really confuse them. I suppose that a simple rule of thumb, if you never want to make it be a student of it, is to remember that uh, number one, the most important thing that can, could get you in trouble is Christ's blood did away with all blood sacrifices, ordinances, blood rituals. And any time you start practicing any of those or think you still have reason to, it is a direct insult in the face of Christ. For as it is written in Hebrews chapter 10, Lo, I come in the volume of the book to be the sacrifice for one and all times, and there shall be no more. So you start talking about sacrificing animals now. You're, you're uh, mocking 
the crucifixion itself, okay? So be a sentry, a guard, a watchman, that the word in your mind is kept accurate, that it isn't changed, that some man doesn't tell you. You don't have to understand the book of Revelation. God is wiser than man. He wrote it for you, mailed it to you, that you would have the word of God to read his letter. Don't put it in some cubby hole somewhere. It offends him. 15. And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. They, they prop themselves up. Seem like they win all the time, doesn't it? Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. It seems like they always win. Well, don't worry, they won't. Okay. It may seem that, and they really prop themselves up, and they beg and squeal and, and let on like if, uh, if you don't jump in to rescue them, they're gone. God takes care of his own teachers. God doesn't send out beggars. Do you want me to say that for you again? God does not send beggars to teach his word. Now, that may offend a lot of people, but I'm a teacher of truth and not one that cares about great, uh, winning any popularity contest with men, but pleasing my Father. Verse 16. Then they that feared, that's to say revered, loved the Lord, spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. He listens. When you have our Father's interest at heart, in your mind, he listens. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared or revered loved the Lord. And that, and, um, that thought upon his name. Do you? Do you know Yahweh? I am that I am. Do you know him? Do you know the Lord God Almighty? He is your father. He's the nearest relative you have. Don't let someone try to substitute a fake Messiah on you. Verse 17. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day. And of course, this is about the Lord's day. In that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. That is to say, uh, the first fruits, a double portion, our Father owns the whole world, and He wants to share that with you. As a matter of fact, the inheritance is even far greater than that, and you can read it in Ezekiel chapter 44, beginning with 25, verse 25. The Zadok in the Hebrew tongue, the just, the upright, the elect, all right? Those that are written in this book He's talking about because they truly want to serve God, not themselves. He said, don't, don't, don't give them an inheritance in Israel. I am their inheritance. So they inherit God, meaning God owning everything. Wherever they step, it belongs to them. Not that they will covet it or take to it selfishly, but to help whatever is upon it. That's what God looks for in the compassion of election. Verse 18, listen carefully. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked. Did it say God was going to discern between you? No, you. Between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Hey, when you pick you a teacher, remember that. It's real simple. Who serves God and who serves something else? I'll give you a little riddle or, or play with numbers here for a moment. This happens to be Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, Chapter 3, verse 18. The last book of the New Testament is Revelations. Take chapter 13, verse 18 there, and you have the exact opposite. It says there in that verse, here is wisdom. Count the number of a man, meaning the son of perdition. You serve him, and you receive the mark of the beast in your forehead. That's where your brain is. Don't let man or Satan deceive you. God's letter prevents it. Why? As it is written in Revelation 9, 4, 
it instills the seal of God in your forehead, which is simply God's plan so that you know beforehand through the prophecy what Satan's going to do as the spurious Messiah. And rather than finding him something that can deceive you as being something that is worshipful, we find him to be an abomination. And shall work against him. That's why many of you will be delivered up. But that's all right. God loves you. And he's going to protect you anyway. Chapter 4 and verse 1. To complete this book. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud. That's, that's those that really make themselves uh, something. Yea, all, they, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. Do you know what happens to stubble in front of a fire? Whoosh, it's gone. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Nothing to continue with. Nothing to grow from. This should remind you, I could say ever so much, our Father is a consuming fire. Our Father's fire to us is the Holy Spirit that touches your heart and mind and soul and it warms you. But that same warming, comforting Holy Spirit will burn the wicked at this time, at His presence. It should remind you of another burning, and I can't help going there. Next chapter over throws you into the New Testament, and it happens to be the great book of Matthew, and in chapter 13, you are told there how you will fight your enemy. We're going to pick it up with verse 37. You will have it on your monitor. Who's going to be burned? It's important that you know. Remember the tares, the Kenites, the sons of Cain? He said, let them grow up. Leave them alone because it looks like wheat, Zawan. But when it matures and you see the seed or the deeds, then you know. But you leave them alone. Why? Because you hurt some of the God's children. But this is what he said about that burning here concerning the planting of the wicked ones on earth. Verse 37. He answered and he said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. That's, that is to say, the seed being the word of God, but also the children. That God breathed that breath of life into the flesh. 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Not seed, not uh, goonie birds, but children, people of the wicked one. Who's the wicked one? Satan. All right. 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. I mean, he's not teaching a parable here. He's explaining one. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Not you, not a flesh being. You leave them alone. The reapers of the tares are the angels. You may be by that time, okay? For this is after the change. It's at the end of the millennium, verse 40. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of this world. That's the way it's going to happen. They write their own sentence. They deserved it. Well, well, can they help it if Satan planted them? They sure can. Christ died on the Christ for all, cross for all. All they have to do is repent, and they have eternal salvation. It's that simple. Rather than being a terror and a son of Cain or Satan, they become a child of God. Verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. They're going to be gone to complete. 42. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Why? Well, unfortunately, there's going to be a few that are going to believe Satan to the bitter end. I got some bad news for them. God doesn't like it. Returning to Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, and it reads, But unto you that fear my name, that, that love me, 
shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And of course, who is the son of righteousness? That is to say the light. I am the light. I am the way. Naturally, that is the sun. And wings is better rays of light, rays of righteousness. That comes from only one, and that is Yeshua Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus the Christ. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. The Hebrew is not translated well here. It's like, and if you've never experienced this, the people up north experience it more often than we do because they have to stall their livestock all winter long because of the temperatures. But then what it's saying is you are rather like a calf that is turned loose from the stall. And if you've never been around uh, animals, you can't appreciate it until you see those little critters as when they're turned loose. They run, they jump, they kick. They, they, they just go for hours at a time enjoying themselves in the pastures running free. He's saying you're free. It's a, it's a wonderful occasion, all right, to know that Christ makes it all right. Why? We've got the victory. Verse 3, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this. That I take action, saith the Lord of hosts. Do you know what day that is? You can read of it. He sent Satan to death in the first earth age, which you will find written in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse uh, 18 and 19, where he's turned to ashes from within. Turning to, being turned to ashes is forever and ever and ever. Verse 4. Don't ever forget what we're about to read. Remember, ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all is well with the statutes and judgments. It's the law. Moses brought the law. Do I want you to bring to mind for a moment the Mount of Transfiguration. Who appeared to Jesus, with Jesus rather, in transfigured bodies. And the disciples were at that mount and they saw them. And they wanted to build three tabernacles there. Naturally, it was Moses and Elijah and Christ in his transformed body. Moses, many people believe, died and was buried. Who buried him? God did. Figure it out. I think it's very interesting that Moses and Elijah, Elijah, of course, being the prophets and Moses the law, appeared and are brought back at this time. Remember the law. Don't let someone change it for you. Remember the difference between statutes and know that and ordinances and know which have been uh, fulfilled to the point that Christ fulfilled them. They were nailed to the cross with him. You have a total, complete list, basically, in Chronicles chapter 2. I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 2. But learn the difference, okay? If you need a little help in the languages, I have two tapes titled The Law that will help you a great deal. And you should know the difference between commandments, statutes, and ordinances. Don't forget them. Don't let people change them on you is what God is saying. Moses was a servant of God that God sent with that truth for you to absorb, to keep you out of trouble. Verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And I believe with all my heart that he shall come. A John the Baptist was not Elijah. John the Baptist did not claim to be Elijah. In the book of John, John the Baptist, quite the contrary, said when asked, are you Elijah? No, I am not. Why? Christ would say in Matthew chapter 11, as, as I forestated, that um, if you will receive him. No, they didn't receive him. Luke chapter 1, verse about, what, 16, you'll find that John the Baptist came rather in the spirit of Elijah. And I can say to you that any of you that try to turn the hearts of the children back to the true father is a part of the Elijah ministry because that's his duty. Listen to it in the next verse. God promises that. Six, 
and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Did you notice there's fathers plural there? I only thought there was one father. You know? Well, for a Christian, that's true. We have our father. But for the wicked, they have a father also. It's called the devil. Okay? And then it continues to say, and the heart of the children to their fathers, plural again. In other words, uh, let me finish. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And the final word of the Old Testament is the warning that I will smite it with a curse. Now, let me tell you something about the truth. The truth, when it is taught proper, properly with emphasis and irony, and the temperance, in, for God has emotions, that in the Hebrew tongue, it's brought out. And when it is taught in that way, some people misunderstand that for arrogance on the speaker's part. It is not. God is very disciplined, and he expects you to be. But those that, um, that hear that and consider it arrogance usually are turned to Satan. Unfortunately, that happens to be their father. When they feel Almighty God is arrogant, naturally they're going to find another father, and it's real sad. He's a sweet daddy. Hmm? The book of Daniel declares that he comes in prosperly, prosperously and peacefully. You sweet things, all debts are forgiven. He's got quite an act. It's Satan's method of operation. And, you know, secondly... That particular father, well, I would know him. He has a pitchfork, and he has two horns, and he wears red long-handle underwear all the time, and smoke comes out of his nostrils. You're so misled, my friend. He was the most beautiful of the archangels and still is. He looks much like you picture Christ, and he's coming first. Most people will think he is Christ. Their hearts are turned back, unfortunately, to the wrong father. What protects you? Knowing God's truth. The words of Moses. He warned. Did Moses not place a serpent on a staff and it was worshipped? Think about it. That was a forerunner of the warnings. The book of Malachi. I so enjoyed teaching it concerning the Lord's day. And two brothers. Esau, God hated. Jacob, God loved telling you how to act so that God will love you or hate you, so that you would follow one father or the other. The truth sets you free as a calf from a stall if you accept it. If it runs clear over the buds of your mind and does not seem arrogant, well, it was a little arrogant the way God dressed down some preachers. Hey, if there is some joker tries to take your children, your earthly children, and teach them a bunch of lies to turn them against you, are you going to be arrogant against that individual? I think so. Well, so is father against preachers that mislead his children. He doesn't like it. Can you blame him? I don't know. The choice is yours. That's the minor prophets of the covenant, that's to say the Old Testament. Old, yeah, it's of our father. He was the same yesterday, he is today, and he's going to be that way forever. There's nothing new under the sun. Hey, how are you fixed for knowledge? You find it in the Word of God. All right, bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please?